Uh, next up will be Felix Bert and Daniel Germanus from Deutsche Bahn, who will be talking about predictive maintenance and condition monitoring for remote heavy machinery. Please give them a round of applause. Okay, yeah, good evening. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to have so many people here uh, at this time. So my name is Daniel. I'm here with my colleague uh, Felix and we are working for DB Systel. DB Systel is an IT service provider in Deutsche Bahn. We are uh, roughly 4,000 people, mostly located in Frankfurt, but also Berlin and uh, other locations. And uh, yeah, we are dealing every day with the daily business of Deutsche Bahn, which is basically train stations, a railroad network, high-speed trains, and, um, well, plenty of people. So employees like Felix and me trying to uh, improve on Deutsche Bahn and also you, the customers, riding our trains on a daily basis, right? So wherever there's that many people, there's also plenty of data, and we try to make use of that data. And, um, well, there's on the one hand structured data, uh, like uh, from our customers or from sales, uh, but since Deutsche Bahn is also very heavy asset driven, there's also plenty of unstructured data, sender data, and uh, today we're looking into that um, in a sense to monitor our equipment in order to improve on the quality and the uh, quality that customers experience. So um, there's uh, an venture that we have founded uh, at Deutsche Bahn, which is called Acoustic Infrastructure Monitoring, and we will pr present it to you today, the challenge, and we will look at uh, our customer needs, the system design, and uh, machine learning requirements. And then at the core, uh, Felix uh, is uh, our expert for sound event detection. He will get into these matters, how we can detect failure on equipment early on, and uh, he will also talk about uh, time series analysis and uh, how to report to our customers. So let's have a look at um, uh, acoustic infrastructure monitoring. So we, we are doing condition monitoring as a, um, let's say, precondition in order to achieve uh, predictive maintenance. And um, well, you can see on the pictures uh, what kind of machinery we are focusing on, like high speed trains, um, escalators, for example, and um, well, other machinery that uh, is uh, for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, stuff like that. And um, since we want to develop a platform, we were wondering what kind of sensor is actually universal and uh, also easy to deploy without uh, having to deal with plenty of paperwork uh, because of m modifications of machinery. And therefore, we ended up with microphones. So um, we founded that venture and we have been testing different cases so far. And one of the most interesting cases actually deals with escalators. Deutsche Bahn operates about 1,000 of such operators, uh, as, as such uh, escalators at uh, uh, German train stations. And um, I think everybody witnessed uh, such an uh, escalator not working and uh, people end up grumpy with their large uh, luggages uh, not being able to to be carried uh, on the platform. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, um, th these are very rough conditions for escalators. Uh, lots of, let's say, foreign bodies, like a small stone from your shoes or coins and screws, end up in the mechanics and, um, well, make the escalator fail. So this, this is your customer perspective. Deutsche Bahn perspective is these uh, machines are very expensive to maintain. And when uh, there's a foreign body inside and uh, uh, it starts to squeak, uh, it uh, also starts to, to fail, it gets very soon very, very expensive. And therefore, uh, the operator uh, requires an early on um, alarming system in order to detect uh, failures on their escalators. And um, well, from a, a perspective to analyze uh, these acoustic manifestations of the failures, uh, they can differ actually in length, in intensity, and um, well, this, this was the main challenge in the modeling actually. Um, and uh, yeah, we will present now 
the system design. Um, since uh, we are collecting nationwide uh, the data, we have very rough operating conditions uh, below an escalator. It's not a very, let's say, uh, nice environment. Uh, we have a very comprehensive software stack and uh, require also elastic services in order to deal with that data collection and uh, also the machine learning inference. Um, yes, so I will skip to the next slide. Here you see actually our edge devices. So we are happy to put microphones actually everywhere at Deutsche Bahn in order to gather data. And um, we, we are using uh, a RACT Raspberry Pi 3 system uh, using a main board from Embedded Pi, which you can see here on the larger left picture. And uh, it is uh, equipped with a very strong antenna in order to get um, a cell phone connection even uh, deep in the belly of a, um, of a train station. And uh, the, the top part is, is the microphone that we are actually using. Um, so most of our operational services are hosted at... Uh, Amazon Web Services, and um, yeah, we are using OpenShift scaling, and uh, yeah, we uh, established a system in order to uh, collect and uh, persist our data. And then at the core of our operational services are uh, the um, methods for sound event detection, and uh, also customer alerting is uh, very important here. Um, but besides that, uh, since we have a fleet of uh, these recording boxes that I showed you on the previous slide, we also have to do uh, edge device health monitoring and device management in order to scale our business to the needs of our customers. And uh, well, from a data science stack perspective, I guess uh, it's more or less uh, uh, it's more or less a, a very common stack. We we have uh, lots of pre-processing in order to compress the sound on the. Uh, edge device in the field in order to reduce the bandwidth requirements for transmissions. Um, we developed uh, plenty of pipelines and uh, yeah, at the core we are using neural networks. Uh, Felix will go deeper into that uh, later on. And we are using supervised and unsupervised approaches. I think today we will focus on the supervised ones. And um, yeah, that's uh, more or less it. We are using TensorFlow in development, uh, we are using Jupyter Hub and uh, the default toolbox of libraries that you are well aware of. Okay, I think I'll hand over to Felix now. Okay, thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> so, um, when we started this use case, of course, what's our long term requirement is to get a data set, and um, specifically with the escalators, you have. Um, a really complex machine, lots of different parts can fail. So um, a real challenge is to get labels um, if we wanna specifically detect failure states and um, that's what we focused on. And um, like many data startups, we had the same problems, like how do you get those labels? Um, in theory, it sounds great. Um, you have experts that come and help you, but um, we kind of um, want to take that a bit more in our hands and see um, what we can do. So um, what we did, we basically created our own data set based on what we collected in our proof of concept phase. And um, that unfortunately meant a lot of labeling. Um, so that's why I have this um, sad smiley on the right side. Um, we had this data set with, with um, annotated audio files, which are annotated to millisecond level. So um, when we started out, we actually um, thought, okay, um, let's try this uh, focusing on different sized chunks of um, audio. But right now we are more focusing on actually um, detecting um, like really small squeaks, say, and then aggregating that in the long run. Um, we have uh, 12 different target classes at the moment and um, it was a real huge team effort. <coughs> So uh, when you typically think of audio, you might uh, see those waveforms um, and there are in the acoustic uh, scene classification or sound event detection uh, approaches where you could learn on that uh, raw audio data basically. But um, what we are doing is um, 
you want to focus on some uh, yeah uh, I missed the transition so um, you have uh, many samples and um, we kind of want to reduce the amount of data points uh, that we use for learning um, so what you would see oftentimes is that people do uh, transform to a, a spectrogram which is basically um, uh, Fourier transform um, on different frames of the audio, but that still has a lot of um, data points. Um, and um, if you uh, apply mel what's called MEL filtering, you um, get uh, you don't lose too much of the information, but you um, reduce the amount of data points you need for training. And uh, also, some log compression is typically um, used, kind of. Uh, to make um, the interesting parts stand out more, so to say. Um, so this is what we are using for learning. Um, I mentioned the labeling. Um, we found a cool labeling tool, um, which is uh, open source, what we are using. Um, so you can see, we can basically see those spectrograms and uh, on a millisecond basis label um, what kind of um, yeah, type of failure we would be in. And um, here's actually like a small video where you can see that you can play the sound, see what's happening, and then uh, select a specific area and say, okay, this, this sounds normal. Um, the heart of our system basically is, as Daniel said, a, um, a deep learning model. So uh, we use those spectrograms and uh, much like you would see in uh, computer vision, uh, we have these uh, convolutional um, parts of the network. And um, in our uh, newer versions of the models we deploy, we also also have um, these uh, long short-term memory um, parts. And um, basically, um, the architecture is quite uh, much what you would see in uh, other uh, scenarios there. It's really important to have like good quality data and um, also those labels. And, um, so if we train that well and have enough data, we should be able to detect bad sounds. Um, what is the output of our network? Um, yeah, just a second. Yeah. Um, I think you need the box. Um, or maybe we can do the questions at the end if you don't mind. OK. Um, so the output of our network would basically, for each class, be an activation function over time. So. Um, the audio, what I showed you earlier, um, it's actually uh, supposed to show you squeaks and um, like this is like the confidence of the network, so to say, in um, where it thinks there's a squeak rele uh, rel relevant. And um, if you put this uh, spectrogram over it, you see that uh, this overlay actually works quite well. Um, you can see the squeaks, it has these um, parallel lines, basically. Um, I think we have an audio example coming up so you can uh, see uh, here for yourself. Um, and um, so if we kind of um, apply a threshold there, we can quite well cut out um, what kind of sound is happening where. And based on that, we can say, okay, in these five seconds, there were 2.98 seconds uh, in which it was squeaking. So, okay, so it's uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Not working just a second. Um. Okay, I hope some of you heard that, but <laughs> <coughs> good. So far, so good. Um, obviously, we were really happy when we had a model and okay, it looked fine. And um, what our customer wants is to see how does this work in the long run? They don't want to know about every squeak. They want to know, okay, do I need to send a technician there now or what? So, of course, we need to look at it in the long run. and. Um, so when we looked at it in the longer run, this is what we got out at first, and we thought, okay, is this a reasonable aggregation? And um, maybe we changed the time frame a bit at which we are looking at it. Okay, we can see something is changing there, right there in the middle. Uh, I don't see the dates right now, but also it's not so sure. 
if we change the time frame again, what we saw earlier as a change might be only a minor thing in this chart. So, um, okay, uh, we needed to do something about aggregation. And um, so we can look at it from two perspectives. Um, on the one hand, we have this um, extreme noise in the time domain, kind of. When we're looking at this, it's like super noisy and um, we need some kind of aggregation there. And another uh, perspective is the domain. Um, so if you think about an escalator and if the steps are a little bit tilted, you might think, okay, this could be squeaking if it's just a little bit, but um, if it tilts a little more, you would see that actually it turns into grinding, like really the metal working on the metal. So um, some parts are kind of always occurring um, like in a sliding um, transition. So some of them belong to the together, others not, but we would actually like to look at one signal. So you also kind of need an aggregation in that um, domain. So if we go from the left to the right, you can actually see that um, what happens if you aggregate over this output on um, different uh, rolling mean time, uh, time windows, basically. And if you go from top to um, bottom, you would see that this is actually um, these example classes um, squeak, grind, outlier, as they are uh, named here, like basically a naive um, yeah, fusion of those. Um, of course, you can uh, try different ones with that, but um, if we um, see those um, aggregation things, we see there's some kind of zoom effect. Um, we need to look at it not only in one kind of uh, time frame, we need to uh, look at more. Um, you need to apply some domain knowledge. Um, some uh, faults might occur within one hour. Others uh, might take much longer uh, to come up. Um, you have the temporary uh, perspective that um, um, you just need to aggregate it because the output of this network is too noisy. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, you kind of need to fuse those classes. <coughs> So um, if we look at the picture from the bottom right, you would see, okay, this is much clearer. You see here's the part where um, something is happening definitely for maybe a couple of hours. Over here, it's actually a couple of days. And if we look at the back, we see that there's maybe some kind of level shift happening. Um, so um, of course we want to automate this. Um, so we developed this kind of feature which could call trend report or something. Um, so we looked at different uh, types of aggregation and uh, applied uh, like a time series decomposition, which I have as an example here. So it's typical um, trend seasonal components and um, error components. Um, and um, if you look at this, okay, how can we apply this? Um, we would like to have this threshold here. Um, what you could usually do is see the trend and um, basically um, take out the uh, like make it structural uh, the, the seasonal decomposition and put um, some kind of um, rolling um, standard deviation on top of it and um, basically then have this uh, threshold. Um, uh, what we see is that when it's actually going down here, that's uh, always the night. So if you think why would the network uh, go down in the night, the output of it, it's actually because in the night quite often it's very silent and they put the escalator out. So we don't want to make the error of uh, calculating that out when um, in the future maybe one night they will have it on or something. So um, we said, okay, um, we need something else. So we applied uh, basically what you would get if you uh, make the decomposition on a different time frame and put that on top. So if we colorize that, we see, okay, um, we can find out um, hours in which there's um, something happening. And if you threshold this with um, like your, um, how many anomalies or anomalous hours you would allow within a certain time frame, you can actually automate it. And um, this is what we wanted to arrive at. And um, so far um, we uh, have actually um, uh, enabled our customer to um, apply, uh, like go to the equipment really fast and also kind of enabled them to save quite a lot, a lot of money in their maintenance. And um, this is an example from that picture. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we can hear that it's clearly uh, something really bad happening. Metal is working on metal. If you think that uh, those steps will go around and around, it means not one of them will break, but all of them, which is really expensive. And um, that's what we try to achieve. <coughs> so uh, thank you for your time. And um, maybe you have some question, feel free. And again, thanks um, for the opportunity to be here. Any question for Felix and Daniel? Hi. Um, have you managed to close the loop um, to make it a supervised problem? Do you, have you got contact with the maintenance crews and their reports so that you can train supervised? Um, yes. So um, we had uh, completed the proof of concept and we have actually now um, been um, transitioning into like this um, bigger rollout. Um, and uh, part of that rollout is that we have these regular feedback sessions uh, with the um, technical uh, personnel and the technical managers to get the feedback of um, what was the root cause and um, what were you thinking about how it sounded so we can kind of uh, use that to continuously improve our models and also move away from those, um, you know, from like basically apply their um, expert knowledge. Hi, thank you. Great talk. Um, what kind of seasonalities do you observe in your uh, time series? Is it really seasons in terms of you know year terms, or is it something else? So um, the strongest component is like uh, daily seasonality, so to speak, um, because usually um, they either turn them off at the night, or um, they can also move into this kind of sleep state where the escalator moves at a much slower speed and if someone enters this kind of, uh, I don't know how it works, some kind of light barrier thing, and then it will speed up again. So um, it will be much more quiet and you will hear much less of the anomalous noises. So we have this like really strong daily seasonality and then you can also watch uh, a little bit on over the week. So the weekends differ from the weekdays. I have a question about uh, ex actually escalators. Are they all the same type or are there differences between them and do you use that information? So um, for Deutsche Bahn there are like four manufacturers, large manufacturers for escalators and uh, yeah, like 10, 15 different models. Um, currently we are focusing on two very prominent ones uh, which also um, have a expected lifetime of another more years so we are not focusing on end-of-life installations. And uh, we developed a couple of models, so for, let's say, Schindler, for Tussen, for example. And um, yeah, that's it. Hello. Well, my question was a little bit related to the last one. So how do you, do, how do you calibrate uh, your equipment uh, in, in these escalators? And also, um, I was wondering more about the uh, audio processing. Uh, you were using the MEL filter scale, and why are you using that? Just to compress information, because that's related more to the human uh, audio system. And yes, this convolution, how, how do you apply this uh, convolution to, to the feature that you extract from the MEL? Um. So uh, the, the MEL uh, filtering uh, is something that's, uh, so we tried, diff of course, different uh, reprocessing methods, basically um, parameter grid search, like this reprocessing with spectrogram work better than with log MEL spectrograms. And um, in our case, we found out that this um, works better. So you could say this is like a data-driven decision. Um, and uh, concerning the convolution, um, so you can basically treat the spectrograms um, like a picture, and then um, the networks you would use uh, to detect uh, certain sounds uh, within that picture, or in that case, audio spectrogram, uh, are really similar to what you would find in um, computer vision. So it's 
layered convolutional layers, uh, you have uh, pooling layers, uh, and then some fully connected layers at the end. Uh, so, and um, if you're interested, we can uh, chat uh, a bit afterwards uh, if you want to know more or have some references or something. Thank you, it was a very, very interesting talk. My question is kind of related to that, or you kind of answered it. I was wondering about the, uh, the fact that you're using a bi-directional LSTM for something that should like advance in time and you can't look into the future really for the other side of the bi-directional LSTM. But it seems like you are windowing or something the, the, the measurements and applying that. How are you doing it exactly? Yeah, so... Um, so of course, absolutely correct. We don't have this um, hard real-time uh, need or anything. So um, since we're also anyway later on doing aggregation and uh, we don't want to uh, send alerts if something starts to squeak a little, uh, but we want to see that over a longer time frame. Uh, we're talking more like hours, days, weeks, um, and a certain amount of that in that time. So. It's not a huge issue for us, and uh, we can just utilize that knowledge which you would not have in, in that other kind of uh, scenario, and um, yeah, just maybe get a little bit better performance. Cool, thank you. Thanks once more for Felix and Daniel. Give a round of applause.